we're back. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the history of Byzantine art, which is a continuation of early Christian art. It's the next phase, uh, though out, uh, out east uh, of the Holy Roman Empire. And so it's nice to have a map here. Uh, we did a timeline with the first one. This time we're going to start out with, with, with the map. So we start out temporal, now we go spatial, right? Um, so we were more or less um, around Rome here last uh, in the first part of class. And then, of course, also um, around here, modern day Palestine, Israel. Um, uh, this, is, this is Jerusalem, right? A, a very contested site, as we're going to talk about uh, next week in many ways. And so um, what happens, like I told you before, uh, in 330, uh, the capital of, 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 of the Roman Empire, which becomes the Holy Roman Empire, the Christian Roman Empire, um, gets moved out to over here, Constantinople, uh, by Constantine. So in a very humble way, he names it after himself, right, <laughs> Constantine, um, uh, which is modern day Istanbul. And so it's very important to realize what happens over the over the course of the few centuries after this move to, to Constantinople. What happens is that the, the the Western Empire here, so this would be Western Europe today. Um, we're talking about um, Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, parts of the, the the British Isles, of course Italy, and then also parts of Northern um, Africa. Right, all of these would have been part of the, the Roman Empire, then the Holy Roman Empire once it becomes Christianized. But over the course of uh, 300, 400, 500, uh, 600 common era, these centuries, what happens is you have what used to be called the barbarian invasions. Even this old map still says barbarian. Uh, we don't call them barbarians anymore. Uh, but these were uh, peoples that were living in what's modern day uh, uh, northern western Europe, the Franks, the Visigoths, the Goths, the Anglo Saxons, there are these tribes, like and the Lombards, um, there are these tribes that, that um, started to uh, migrate and they started to take over territories and they took over large parts of the western Roman Empire. Um, so, this is an important part, part of the history, right? So, in many ways, the, the, the Western Empire is no more during this period, um, of course, until these quote-unquote barbarians become Christianized, right, which they will. Um, so uh, the power moves out east, right, and is centered around Constantinople for, the, for these centuries, um, and eventually the church is going to split between east and west, but there we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So for the most most part today, we're going to be near here. We're going to be near Constantinople. Constant, Constantinople. Um, it's called the Byzantine Empire today because the, 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 the city that it was founded on was, was called Byzantium. Um, today it's modern day Istanbul. Um, I don't know if have you, any of you have ever been to Istanbul. Um, this is one of those dream cities. I've always wanted to to visit, uh, uh, visit Istanbul. It's supposed to be a completely knockout city, like an incredible, an incredible city. Um, and this is obviously a modern day panoramic image of it. But already you can tell there's one structure that seems to dominate the landscape. Um, and this is this is the most the most important um, religious structure and one of the most important churches um, for, for for Christians. Um, in, in, in this history, um, and that is the Hagia Sophia. So this was not built by Constantine himself, because of course this is now a couple centuries after his rule, or a century and a half, no, a couple centuries. Um, this was built by um, an un another emperor, um, uh, the most emperor, for, uh, the most important emperor for this time period, who we're going to meet in a second um, in, in a mural. And that's Justinian. Um, so we don't we, we do know who the architects are here. Um, um, again, a rarity in some in some cases early in this early uh, period of art. Um, Anthemius of Tralles and Isidorus of Miletus. So these two were commissioned by um, um, by Justinian to make the greatest. They, they were they were they were uh, um, tasked to make like the greatest church. Um, in, in the world. Um, and it is massive. 
Um, it is a feat of engineering wonder. They weren't actually architects. One was more of what we. One was more of a mathematician. The other was more of like an engineer, of, I guess physicist in some ways, um, not in the modern sense. Um, and so a lot of scholars say that since they weren't technically architects, they they could dream a little bit more. Like they 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 weren't as restrained in what was possible, and so they 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 did what was deemed to be. Um, in in many ways impossible. I um, mean, you're gonna you're gonna notice this from from inside uh, because the inside is, is unbelievable. This is the outside, and it's a really beautiful photograph of the Hagia Sophia. Um, Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom. Hagia um, is 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 holy, and Sophie Sophia. Um, a lot of people you know, their name Sophie. That means wisdom. Um, so this is the the Church of the Holy Wisdom, um, and it's this beautiful sort of night scene of it. Um, it's all lit up, so you get you get the sense of how complex it is as, as an architectural structure. Um, you're also seeing signs that are non-Christian, right? So you have the crescent at the top of the dome here, and you have these four spires. These are actually minarets, um, architectural um, staples in Islamic architecture that we're going to study next week. Um, so this structure today... Um, is a museum, although um, Erdogan, um, the, the, the president of, of Turkey, he wants to convert it back to a mosque. And it was a mosque after it was a church for a long time. When the Ottoman Empire um, conquers the Byzantine Empire in, what is it, 1453, um, it becomes a mosque, right? So there's a long, complex history uh, and and fighting it's a very contested site throughout these many uh, these many centuries in, in fact like this a millennia and a half right um it's a really complex site at the level of the politics and i'm going to upload a video for you uh, which i normally show in class but i'm not going to show it in, in class here uh, because it's a little too a little too long to do just on, on the computer screen but i will upload it alongside this this lecture because it's good it's like a ted animated talk uh, that gives you the whole complex and really tortured history of this um, of of this uh, of this church turned mosque turned museum, uh, and it might very well turn into a mosque again um, in 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 our time. Um, so we'll we'll see. So here is the here is the the center, and it's very very large. Um, it's incredible. It's it's larger than the um, than than the Pantheon, and you can tell it's a dome on a drum. So here you have the, the dome. But rather than the oculus in the center, right, that, that we have in the Pantheon, the light comes in through this circle, this ring of light that, that goes on the sides here. So they somehow figured out a way to make this dome and to have these windows at the bottom of the dome. Um, they did it by using these pendants, uh, these architectural, um, uh, they're almost like buttressing the um, the 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 dome, um, and you have like these mini domes, these half domes, spherical domes that are on the sides here holding everything up. And so uh, this was often deemed to be like um, miraculous. So just imagine, one of the things that's good to do in this class is to try to forget who you are now and forget everything you know about engineering or about you know modern science and so on and so forth. But just imagine being a normal person living in 550 uh, in, 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 under the rule of of of, um, of Justinian, uh, you probably couldn't read. Um, you would probably get most of the the scripture or or the stories from images, um, and you certainly wouldn't know anything about gravity. You wouldn't even know what light is made out of. Uh, light would simply be like a holy a holy emanation, um, and it certainly would be once it enters a church. There's a long history of this. Um, you would probably be very superstitious. Uh, you, your your uh, worldview would be wholly conditioned by your beliefs, um, and by and by your faith in a way that I think we we don't have access to today uh, because we're so firmly entrenched in a history of of modernity and science um, and so on and so forth. Um, so imagine yourself walking into the church and you don't know all the stuff that you know about today. This would read like a miracle to you. This would read like a dome that's floating on a ring of of uh, of light, right? Um, especially on a very sunny day, um, and that's how it was thought of. Like they 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 thought that this wasn't built by like human humans. This was like some sort of miraculous structure with this dome floating on this this holy light. Um, so the architecture itself 
is not only a feat of engineering, it, it's all, it was also symbolic and it was drenched with holy meaning uh, for people, as were all the mosaics, as were all um, everything else that would happen um, inside inside the, this church. So check out the check out the video on on this on this structure because it's really uh, um, uh, it's 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 a it's a fascinating political history, and so here we have just a nice succession of scale. Uh, this is the Pantheon in Rome, um, and here is the Hagia Sophia. So it is higher, um, it is wider, it is bigger, um, and then we can compare it to other things, right? So we're going to end up studying the Florence Cathedral. We're going to end up seeing St. Peter's Basilica. Um, here's the Taj Mahal, um, here's St. Paul's Cathedral, here's the U.S. Capitol. So you can get a sense of the scale. So these are massive, massive um, structures. And if you want more comparison of scale, look up top here. All the way from the pyramids to the Eiffel Tower to the Chrysler Building, uh, and so on and so forth. So you get a sense of, of scale of human architecture throughout throughout time. So this is a really great, uh, great graph. Um, so this is that video, and I will upload it for you. Um, I'll embed it for you in, in the website. And so inside the Hagia Sophia, um, and in fact, actually, maybe what you should do is just pause this now, watch that, watch this video, and then, and then come back, uh, because that'll be a more seamless experience. So go ahead and do that. Um, and so uh, one of the things that you would have seen in the video and talked about are these incredible mosaics inside the inside the, the Hagia Sophia and how some mosaics are, are hidden above others um, and, and murals and so on and so forth. There's this whole complex l political layer of different faiths. Um, mosaics are, think of it as like painting in precious stone. Uh, mosaics are made of glass or stone or ceramic and these are called tesserae. Um, um, these are like the individual units that, you, that, you, that will be built up and will color um, the, the, uh, the image. Um, and so it has a very exact practice. You have to cut everything out. You have to, you have to be very methodical about it. So here's an example, just like a very close up. You almost think of it as like pixels before pixels, right? Um, not that we see pixels anymore in most of our electronic devices, but we used to see pixels. Um, um, you're getting, you're seeing the individual units. Uh, so this is a hand, and there's like a ring, and this is probably clothing, right? So this is this is how it's implemented. And probably the most famous Byzantine mosaics um, are not in the Hagia Sophia, but are in this church in uh, Ravenna, called San Vitale. And the one we're going to focus on uh, is this one, and the one facing it here. Like they're kind of looking at each other. Um, and I show it to you in this space. So I think I have an arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna look at this mosaic um, a little bit more in depth. But notice where it is in space. So this is an image of Christ on a globe with angels and so on and so forth. Um, he's at the center. He's of course the most important figure in this church. So in these in this mural that we're that we're turning to next, there is no depiction of Christ. Sometimes people think that that this guy in the center is a depiction of Christ, but but he's not. Um, that is Justinian. That is this emperor we've been talking about, who does this massive rebuilding program in um, in Constantinople, and he's he commissions the Hagia Sophia. So he's really important. Emperor, um, who, if you watch the video, survived all these the Nikkei riots and, and all these revolts and so on and so forth. So, uh, all these political upheavals. So, this is not in Constantinople, it's in Ravenna, Italy. Um, so, for a brief moment here, this is one part that's not taken over by these northern migratory tribes. And this is Justinian himself, although he never actually went to this church, he never actually stepped foot in Ravenna. Um, um, though the image of a ruler can stand in for that ruler. It's quite incredible. There's a history of like uh, representations of rulers sort of um, holding a meeting or being part of a meeting, and then everybody understood that that, that ruler was actually part of that meeting, right? Um, this is a very different understanding of an image than we have today. It's a much more metaphysical, miraculous understanding of, of images uh, as mediating figures and especially mediating holy figures, right? So this is the emperor himself. 
um, and he would be the only person that would be allowed to be in this part of the church that's being represented. And not only that, he's holding one of the most important objects of the church, which is the 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 um, the bowl for the Eucharist, the important liturgy for Christians, the body of Christ as bread, um, and the wine of, of Christ as, as blood. So he's holding a really important object for the liturgy, liturgy. And he's more or less, he's almost in the center of this thing. Right? And he's dressed in purple. Uh, purple usually has connotations of royalty and gold. Um, he has a halo himself. So, of course, the emperor uh, is divinely ordained. There's a, there's a, there's a, the, there's a, um, a contract in many ways between the religion um, and the state. There is absolutely no separation of church and state here in the way we might understand it today. So he's in the center and he has his attendants. Um, and his soldiers. And the soldiers are, are holding a, a shield here, and you'll, you'll recognize this symbol, right? This is the Cairo symbol. This is that very symbol that uh, a few centuries before Constantinople told his troops to put on their shield, that it would protect them on the Milvian Bridge. So this is a long, this has a long history in, um, in the history of, of the Roman Empire and Christianity. Then on, the, on this side, uh, you have the bishop, um, Bishop Maximanius. He's the bishop of this church, um, and he's he's holding a cross, the, the very important symbol for for Christians. And he has their fellow clergymen next to him. One of one of whom is holding one of these incense burners that's purifying. Um, and that's another thing to keep in mind when you were in these churches. Not only would you have things to look at, not only ha you would have things to listen. There would be chanting, and eventually, like incredible musical compositions that we're going to talk about in this class. Uh, but you would also have smells. Um, um, and you have these, these smells that are coming from candles and from incense. So that's all part of the sort of synesthetic experience of these, of these, of these spaces. And so at first you think that uh, Justinian is the emperor and he sort of is taking center stage. Uh, but in fact, there's a subtle way in which the artist has tried to balance the power between the emperor and the clergy, especially the bishop. So notice at the top, uh, it does look like the emperor is stepping forward, like his body is is in front of the bishop. You kind of notice that he's sort of uh, uh, stepping into the space. Uh, um, the, the top part of his body is in the space of the bishop and he's more forward. But then if you go further down, a weird warping happens where the body of the bishop is actually clearly ahead of, the, of Justinian. And so it's as if uh, these are almost like two playing cards or something. Notice in Byzantine art, the, the figure, we're very far away now from Greco-Roman art where the point of art was to show the world naturalistically, especially the human form. Uh, here the human form does not matter as much. Um, these are these are figures that convey an idea. Um, the artist is not trying to be naturalistic, um, and in fact, look at them looking at you. Uh, whereas Polyclitus and the spear bearer couldn't care less about you. He's this man god, who who you know is in physical perfection. Like you, you don't even matter, right? Uh, here it's very different. Uh, here it's these almost bodiless, very two-dimensional figures that are staring you down, right? Uh, you're very much implicated. In, in this scene. So the body in uh, Byzantine art, and this is something that, that, that stays the course through almost all of Christian, Christian art, it's downplayed. It's not as important as the idea. Um, so in Christianity, the soul, the Christian soul, is much more important than the body. And the body is usually coded as, as sinful, as desirous, as, as you know, this corruptible flesh. Whereas the soul is the more important holy thing, right? So it makes sense that the visual culture and the art of, of a lot of Christian art would, would try to convey ideas that are more symbolic, that are more ethereal, that are more metaphysical than corporeal, than like of the body and naturalistic, right? So that explains why the artist is giving you these figures in almost this stylized, very flat sort of way. But then he has to convey ideas in, in, in ways that are, that are not open to him um, if he could just be more naturalistic, right? So instead of, of, of uh, having these two guys stand next to each other as if they were equals, um, he's almost like folded them um, to try to convey this, this equality through these very flat figures. So the bishop is forward at the bottom, 
uh, whereas Justinian is forward at the top. So this balance between the, the clergy, the church, and the emperor. And then there's all this other line of scholars notice, like they're stepping on feet on the bottom here. Uh, this also conveys hierarchy, uh, like who's more important than the other. So um, even though this is a religious scene, and the scene from within a church that actually never happened. This is just a representation. Um, the, the, um, even though even though it's just a, a, a representation, um, um, it is c conveying a political hierarchy here, right, between the church and the emperor. And one last thing to note about this, and this is typical Byzantine mosaic and visual culture. The background is total gold. Uh, there's no like landscape. There's no representation it's gold which 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 is always a symbol of divinity so with byzantine art we've really moved away from naturalistic representations which we had in early christian art you saw it on that sarcophagus now we're moving to something much more symbolic stylized um, um, and and more metaphysical in in in, in some cases that that suits this um, this belief system of, of Christianity. On the other side, you would have had uh, um, Empress Theodora, who wouldn't have been, even though she's the Empress, she wouldn't have been allowed in the same space as the men, uh, wouldn't have been allowed as the same, same space. And again, Justinian is the only person that could be in this holy space alongside the clergy and his attendants. So she would have been outside in the courtyard of the San Vitale. And we have the same thing as her. She's stepping on feet or she's she's more prominent because she's slightly placed forward. Um, uh, and she has all her attendants with her, right? So she's actually a very important figure because um, if you have watched that, if you watched that video, you'd know that she's the one who convinces Justinian to stick around and, and keep fighting for uh, for his for his kingdom, essentially, uh, for his empire. And so she's, she's really important. Um, so she's also depicted in this. Um, so we've looked at a very famous church, the Hagia Sophia uh, of the Byzantine period. We looked at a very famous mosaic of the Byzantine period uh, with Justinian and the Empress Theodora. But now we look at what are what are probably the most the the, the objects that are the most synonymous with Byzantine art, and those are icons. Um, and an icon is an image of a holy uh, of a holy person. Um, they were very important in the Byzantine church from the third uh, century um, onward, so beginning with early Christianity up into the Byzantine period. And these were images that would be, this is very important to realize, these are images that they, it would have been thought that they actually are tied to the person, the holy person that they're depicting. Like it actually is a sacred object, right? So they would be venerated in churches, but they would also be taken out into public spaces, into private homes, um, and they would they would be believed to have miraculous qualities, especially protective qualities, right? And people would touch them, people would pray to them, people would kiss them, um, and uh, they they they'd be maybe some of the most important objects for uh, Byzantine Byzantine culture. And for the most part, icons would have been painted on wood. Uh, their paintings on, on wood, right? And so here's a very important uh, example of, of an icon. So and it's anonymous. We don't know who the painter is, but it's the Virgin Mary with child, with the Christ child on her lap, with saints and angels. So this is a nice example of an icon. And again, stylistically, you're going to see all all the things that we've talked about with Byzantine art already. The, the figures are uh, pretty stiff. Um, there's no movement. There's not much naturalism. For the most part, they are uh, devoid of physical presence. They, they have much more of, a, of an ethereal presence. They're kind of flat and two-dimensional. You do have a little bit of dimensionality to the, the, the Virgin Mary. You get a sense of knees. Um, the little Christ child, he does have three dimensions. Um, these are two saints uh, that are protecting them. Uh, they have something of a, they have, you know, a little bit of, of weight in the body, but for the most part, it does feel flat, um, and it does feel like you're being implicated um, as a viewer. Uh, those two saints are looking right at you, and the Christ child seems to also be looking right at you. The Virgin Mary is looking a little bit off to the side, 
And then the two angels are looking up. Uh, there's this light that's coming out from the top, and it's hard to see here, but this is a hand, right? So this would be a representation of heaven and of the monotheistic, of the, you know, the Christian God up at the, up at the top. Um, and so this is, this is an example uh, of, of an icon. Um, it's encaustic on wood. Encaustic is a type of paint that's used uh, that where, where wax is involved. Um, it's a very old form of painting. It goes back to Egyptian times. And it will be on wood. These are very precious objects. And it comes from the monastery of St. Catherine's at Mount Sinai. And this is very important because this is one of the few original icons that we have. Uh, there are others, but they're very rare. And there's a reason why these are very rare. Um, this is an example of an icon being taken throughout a city, uh, which still happens today um, in, in Orthodox uh, Christianity. Um, a holy image will be taken out um, during special, uh, special festivals, um, special uh, sacred days on the calendar. Um, and then the, the town, the, the city will be able to uh, see it and pray to it, so on and so forth. So they would very much be used. But let me get back to the point I was making before. That icon that comes out of St. Saint, Saint Catherine's Monastery is very, very important because uh, it's one of the few icons we have that exists that, that's from before the iconoclasm. So the iconoclasm is a really well-known event in the Byzantine Empire where these icons would have been destroyed. Uh, iconoclasm, icon just means image, and clasm is to break. Um, so the iconoclasm means the destroying, the breaking of images. And uh, the, the, the first iconoclasm, the most famous one, was imposed in 726 by Emperor Leo III, um, a successor of Justinian a couple centuries later, right? And so a lot of images in churches, in monasteries, were destroyed. So not many icons like the one we just saw actually survive. Right? And the iconoclasm lasts for about a year. The reason why St. Catherine's icons survived is because they were temporarily, that part, Mount Sinai, was not part of the Byzantine Empire. So it was protected at that period. So um, that's a little fate of history uh, where a lot of these earlier icons are there uh, because it wasn't part of the Byzantine Empire at that time. So they were, they were saved from, from the iconoclasm. And so the interesting question is, well, why start doing this? Why start destroying all these images? Why start destroying these amazing works of art? And scholars still debate this, but there are a number of reasons as to why the iconoclasm might have happened. Um, one is that there, there's the idea that these images were distracting people from true piety. So even though a lot of people would be illiterate and the only access they have to uh, holy scripture and narrative would be either through the holy figure, like a priest um, or a bishop telling them what the story says, um, or images, right? Images are very important to tell stories. But there are some um, people in power, um, religious figures, there are a lot of debates about this. What if people start believing the images themselves are what's important? What if they start thinking that it's the images that are holy and not what the images are trying to convey, right? Uh, so there was a, a real fear that somehow the icons themselves were, were gaining too much power in people's minds and they were being distracted from the, what, what, should, what they should really be uh, preoccupied with, which is the, the, the holy realm, the holy ideas, and the divine figures that can't actually be seen, right? Um, so that's one possibility that scholars discuss. Another is a more geopolitical explanation, um, which might be tied to the, to, the, to the first. So this is definitely the period where uh, you have this in, really incredible in world history. Um, Muslims and um, Arab armies are becoming very powerful um, after being founded just a couple centuries before. They're becoming a very powerful presence, and they're taking over parts of, of Byzantium, uh, of, the, of the Eastern Roman Empire. And Emperor Leo is getting really worried about this. Um, and so he starts to think, well, maybe this is punishment. Uh, maybe God is punishing us uh, because we are praying to too many false idols. Right? This is part of the, um, the, the Ten Commandments. That, will now, that won't pray to a false idol, right? So the, the, the anxiety about images at the time could have been about piety, could have been about praying to the wrong thing, but, but it also could have been 
um, leading to punishment from God, right? We're being punished uh, for having all these images that are that are, that are false idols, and so these these Arab armies are coming uh, are coming for us, right? So that's a more geopolitical explanation, but still tied to these images. The other um, is a little more, I guess, internal. Um, some people say that monasteries. Uh, where a lot of these icons were, were painted, right? Monks would be painting these, 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 these icons that would be very important for people's lives. It was as if the monasteries were starting to gain too much power. Um, the clergy, the monks themselves, were gaining too much power, and the emperor was getting jealous or was worried about the, the power of the monasteries. And so this may be led to the iconoclasm, right? Um, going after the very thing that these monasteries were known for, which would be these icons. The other, which is more of a theological uh, debate, and this one's pretty fascinating to me, honestly, um, there were a lot of the theological debates about the carnality of, of Jesus. Um, the one thing, one thing that's really unique about Christianity, it's one of the only religions where God becomes man. God actually takes on the flesh um, um, in the figure of, of Christ, right? And so there are debates as to well, how can this be represented, right? In some ways, the fact that in Christianity you have a God that becomes a figure uh, that actually takes on human form, which doesn't happen in Islam and it doesn't happen in Judaism, um, that somehow makes it easier to then represent God, right? Because God was actually a human figure, right? Um, but you still run into problems, right? Because... Uh, when debates of the Trinity, where you have God, man, and the Holy Spirit, uh, Christ is not simply a human, right, uh, for Christians, right? So he, he lives in this, like, dual world between flesh and, and, um, and heaven. And so how do you represent this, right? So there are un uncomplicated ways of doing it, right? We saw how fish could be represented, um, or the cross could represent him, uh, the Eucharist certainly can represent him, uh, but what about images, like, what about images, right? Um, <clears throat> how do you represent this man that was not a man, right, for Christians, um, or wasn't only man? Um, and so it, the iconoclasm could have been part of these debates where at some points it was thought that, well, an image is okay because uh, he did take on human form. And other times they would say, no, 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 it's not because he wasn't just a human. So it's tied to these debates about the carnality, um, uh, about the, the becoming... Uh, flesh of, of God in Christianity. So it's very, very complex. And generally speaking, when it comes to image, there were two ways in which images could be allowed. So one would be through like authentic impressions. This is the very famous Shroud of Turin. So the idea is that the that this had um, the face of Christ, and you can see the body here, right? Um, um, that this would be the sheet that was used in his burial, um, that would be an authentic image because it's an actual impression, almost like a photograph, right, of the person. And so it's not mediated by an artist. It's the, it's the actual holy figure himself, right? So this would be an unpainted image, an authentic impression. So this would be one way in which images would not be false idols, right? Another would be to think of, uh, this is, this is, it's not true, it's mythic, but the idea that St. Luke uh, painted the portrait of Mary and, and the child. Um, so uh, it would have been an original drawing that then subsequent artists could simply copy, right? Um, and the provenance of all the copies later on in history could go all the way back to this authentic moment, right? So that would be a way in which the image of the Virgin Mary and the Christ child could be certified as holy and not a false idol, right? Um, and that's often how um, icons have been interpreted, that, that painters have, um, have used the model of St. Luke's drawing of, of the original, um, even though we don't, we don't have it, as like the template. And of course, it never changes, right? This is why Byzantine icons almost always look very similar. Like, how could you change, how could you possibly change the original authentic uh, drawing of St. Luke because it's it's a holy it's a holy drawing, right? You would not want to change it. You would want to keep it as is and just nurture it throughout history, right? Um, so all these debates are happening around the time of the iconoclasm and it's only reversed in 843 by another empress, uh, Theodora. 
Um, and this is a very famous page from a book, a Psalter at the time, that's uh, um, equating. Um, this is iconic. This is an iconoclast. This is a guy destroying an image. He's using like this this uh, solution of vinegar um, on, on this big brush to destroy this image to get rid of this icon. He's equating it with Romans um, persecuting Christ himself. Right. So it, there's there's a there's a reversal here. Um, the image becomes newly important again, and not idolatrous, right? And then after this, you have a whole proliferation of icons once more. So even though all these icons were destroyed, we have new icons that were painted um, afterwards. And this is one very famous example. <clears throat> and this, again, goes back to the idea of an original authentic image from St. Luke. I show you this one, but there, if you Google um, Byzantine icon, especially like uh, Virgin Mary and Christ, you'll see lots of examples that are very similar. It's a type, right? Uh, you can't improve on the original, so artists will, uh, monks will simply keep, uh, keep updating um, and continuing the, this tradition. And the tradition usually involves um, a much larger head of, of the Virgin Mary, with very large eyes, a very long, slender nose, and small, small lips, her her head will often be tilted to one side. Um, her body will almost be in unison with the body of the Christ Child, and their heads are almost like uh, uh, meeting. Right? Um, he's holding her. Uh, this is one of his little hands, one of the other hands. Notice he looks like a like a small adult. Uh, they, they they don't yet depict uh, child children as like little babies. You'll have to wait till the Renaissance for that to see like a depiction of Christ as an as an authentic looking child or baby. Um, but but this is the the type uh, of of the Byzantine icon, and this is called the Vladimir Virgin very famous. It was probably painted in Constantinople, but then it traveled up to what's modern-day Russia, and it moved from city to city, um, and there are mythical stories about how those cities were saved from 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 something uh, because of her presence, because of this icon's presence. Again, these were deemed to be miraculous. Um, and and the, holy, the holiness of these Byzantine icons would, would often, like the mosaic we saw, would have a golden backdrop, and the, the Imagine this in a church with candlelight, with incense. It would be like it would seem as if it, light is coming from it, right? It would be glowing in this in this candlelight. So, um, the gold was not only symbolic of heaven, but it was almost as if the icon itself was luminescent, like exuding its own light, um, furthering its sort of miraculous holy presence for for believers, right? And you notice how. It's pretty damaged. Um, a lot of the gold seems to be chipped off. Um, um, part of the figures seem to be um, um, in, in, in poor shape, although this one is actually in pretty good shape. Um, again, this is encaustic on wood, so wax kind of um, a, a mixture of pigmentation and wax on wood. This is not only because of age. Um, again, these icons would be touched. This is like very different from our, our notion of images in museums today in the West, uh, where um, um, you would probably get arrested uh, or sued if you went and touched a Picasso or kissed it or, or, or did anything to it. Um, but these icons would be actually physically handled. They would be kissed. They would be venerated physically, right? Um, and they would travel quite a bit. And so this would all create wear and tear. But it was not an issue because the original is some way back in history, right? So uh, once it would wear down, a monk would simply start to repaint over it. So they've done studies of these icons. There are layers and layers and layers of paint because um, it's an original image. So just keep updating it, keep filling it out. Don't change it, but but keep refreshing it um, uh, because it has a it has a holy provenance. Again, all the way back, supposedly to Saint Luke's original drawing. And once more in Byzantine art, you're seeing a real de-emphasis of the human form um, and of naturalism. The point of this is not to depict a beautiful woman as the Virgin Mary and a very convincing uh, child as Christ, right? That's not the point. This is not Greek art. The point is much more symbolic. Um, and as we saw with Justinian, the point of the image is a figure looking out at you, making you, like, stopping you in your tracks. And then she 
is holding and kind of pointing you towards what she deems to be important, which is Christ himself, right? Who he is looking up to her. So if you, if you look at her and she kind of tells you to look at him and you look at him, then you, through his, his sight, you're sent back to her face. And then there's almost this endless eternal loop between her, you, and, and Christ, right? This internal, eternal like feedback loop uh, between icon and viewer. Um, which almost feels like it's timeless or something like that, right? That would be an also in, an integral part of the experience of, of, of these icons. Not naturalistic, but you as a viewer implicated in the symbolic message of, of, uh, of this very shallow pictorial space. So these are really amazing paintings. Um, and if you're interested in them, yeah, just Google or go on the Met website and check out all the, all the Byzantine works because they're, they're really lovely. Okay, everyone, that's it for this week. Um, until next week, take care.